Okay, uh, we are going to work on the essential sciences in this clip, and we are going to move into a new unit. So um, let's take a look at that. All right. Wow. Kinesiology and body mechan biomechanics. This is going to be good. So um, sometimes people will have a separate textbook for this. Get myself all good for the video. Um, and it's not necessary, although additional resources and atlases uh, are helpful. Um, and again, for the anatomy and physiology, including this section right here, there are so many resources available to you uh, via the internet um, that uh, it's mind boggling sometimes. So um, I will tell you that this content is, is learned a lot by memorization which means repetition, repetition, repetition. Um, so you got to do that in novel ways. If you don't do different things with the same information, your brain will start to ignore it. So as in previous chapters, there are um, our YouTube guest speakers. And this might be one where you click on the one that I have put up for you, and then you look to the side and see uh, if there might even be others. There are also a lot of apps. Um, go to your Play Store or whatever that is, and there are either free apps or inexpensive apps that you can use to um, learn at least the skeletal system joints and muscles. Now, biomechanics is different. So this is the parts. These three chapters, we're talking about the parts. And then in chapter 10, we're talking about how the parts work together to function. And um, there's a lot of emphasis on this within the massage community, too much, I believe, uh, because the more and more we learn, the more we realize that it is the systems of control um, that are interfacing with the demands of movement, which is down here in the biomechanics uh, concepts. It's, it's the function um, driven by the nervous system, um, and that is what is uh, coordinating these parts right here. And so um, I, I personally, as your teacher and as a textbook author, would like to see more emphasis on the systems of control and less emphasis on uh, the skeletal joint muscles, more emphasis on biomechanics. Um, but that's not the way the MBLEX necessarily sees it. And so we're still kind of stuck in a time warp here about what you're going to have to learn. And so um, it's never, learning is never redundant. Um, and most of uh, chapter seven, chapter eight, and chapter nine, the parts uh, you're going to have to absorb and learn on your own. Uh, study groups are really good with that. Um, there are tons and tons of videos, like I said, on YouTube. Um, so there are plenty, plenty of resources here. In the class, we'll use this language as we're describing the area that we are applying massage. Um, and in the biomechanics segment, there will be a lot of assessment concepts that will override into fundamentals. 
of therapeutic massage for uh, trying to determine what the appropriate target area is and, and treatment function. Um, so, I mean, these are our parts. This is the framework of our body and how we move around. Uh, and so we do need to have a working knowledge of this. So lots of uh, expectation on my part that you are going to diligent work, diligently work your way through this. We are not going to lecture you on this. Um, the online course that goes with this textbook uh, will serve as the lecture and it will lead you sequentially through uh, the study and it does a really good job with it. So, okay, uh, so let's look at the skeletal system here. And let's widen this out. Let's make this a little bigger so I can see it. And um, there are some features in each chapter uh, skeletal system joints, etc., that I want to uh, point out to you uh, that are unique. That's what these chapters do for you in this textbook um, that will help with the retention and the comprehension and the application of this information. So uh, here are our reading segments. Um, and most important in all of this is understanding the names of the bony landmarks. And that is because the uh, muscle structures and the connective tissue encasing and uh, attaching factors of the muscular type soft tissue uh, they use these bony landmarks um, to attach to in, in, in functional groups. And so if, if you have a good working knowledge of bony landmarks um, and where they are on the bones, that's going to help you tremendously when you're uh, working on attachment language of the individual muscles. Okay, um, and then the rest of this is working through the parts as well as uh, the action that there is a physiological function of bone. Uh, they do have uh, the marrow, for example, produces blood cells and is active in the immune system. Um, and uh, yeah, they, uh, there is some pathology that specifically targets the bony structures. So um, it won't take us long to get through this because you just sort of got to know the parts. All right. So here are your objectives. Key terms. Learning how to learn. Um, so the this uh, focus here is just what I explained to you. And this is going to explain kinesiology. That term is often used incorrectly um, to describe bones, joints, and muscles as the parts. That's a nomenclature. The kinesiology is the study of movement and biomechanics. Um, so this box gives you that, you know, a little bit more understanding of that. Um, and then here's your overview of the skeletal system. So here are the functions over and above our framework that we have an endo inside a skeleton so we can grow around it. Uh, that allows um, us to expand as we grow grow up and grow out without having to shed a skeleton like a lobster has to, for example. Um, and then there's uh, cr uh, creatures that don't have 
a skeletal or a bony framework. They might have some cartilage um, and, you know, to create a sense of form, um, but they are not limited by their uh, skeletal structures like we are, but they also couldn't, you know, they're mostly water creatures and we couldn't, we couldn't work in gravity like we do uh, if we didn't have this bony structure. So here are the individual bones coming up and or the, the shape of the bones and the type of bone. Um, and you'll want to have a working definition of these words and, and kind of what they do. Um, I have regularly seen on the uh, or have been told regularly that there are questions about the connective tissue coverings on the bone, which is the periosteum and the endosteum here. Bone development is interesting. Uh, when uh, an infant is born, they're mostly cartilage, and then that cartilage uh, starts to uh, deposit minerals and um, become more dense. And so the bone, live bone is still got some pliability to it, uh, but it does get more dense. And ligaments is the connective tissue structure uh, that holds bones together in joints. And joints are where we move and so there's got to be a slippery surface there um, on the movable joints or the synovial joints so that there's no wear, wear and tear and that's the, your articular cartilage and um, there are other joints in the body where the it's less mobile and so when we get into the joint chapter next you'll see some joints don't have articular cartilage and the ligaments have actually kind of grown together as a fibrous connecting point. Here's all the, a big picture of all of the different structures that make up bone. Um, it's really a pretty magnificent tissue. Uh, bone has retained its regenerative capacity. So, um, and it's got a, a good blood supply. So it'll heal pretty good. As far as injuries go, uh, a bone injury, a fracture of a bone uh, will heal generally better than a ligament um, because it does not, the ligament structures don't have as much of a regenerative capacity, nor do they have as good a blood supply. So the next thing is the different shapes and classifications of bone. And then here, this bone growth and repair. And do, do these activities. They help transfer information into long-term memory. Um, and you do need to be aware uh, of skeletal changes in aging, as well as how the skeleton evolves as we uh, move through the different life stages. So I already mentioned that when a baby is born, they're mostly cartilage. And then there is that shifting through growth and the, uh, how the hormone structure, which we talked about in chapter six, is really involved in that bone growth and what it does with the growth end plate and uh, how the uh, pituitary gland and the growth hormone works on all of that. Typically as we age, in general, we become a little more brittle, a little less pliable. Um, and so that would uh, alter um, our pressure in certain areas on a person who is um, older, uh, especially if they're in the elderly uh, or elder category. Um, 
that they can be more prone to uh, a little fracture. So um, there are some uh, con contraindications and cautions we need to think of here. Use your section summary to review the content. Read the practical applications. There's always some little nuggets in there. Um, bone is a crystalline structure. It's a connective tissue crystalline structure, which means the um, molecules line up a certain way. And it it when a, a, it becomes uh, stimulated, a crystalline structure is stimulated, then you get a piezoelectrical event. And there has been some speculation about whether or not that's part of the energetic functions of the body is the piezo effect. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, I do know that they do use uh, electrical current as bone stimulators. Uh, and I do know that they use vibration. They used to. They used to use vibration um, with a tuning fork, for example, uh, to check for if there was a bone break or, or something going on with the bone. It would uh, have a certain sensation. I uh, grew up um, under the care of a uh, hometown osteopath, and I can remember him using a tuning fork for uh, some of his assessments. So here's our focus on professionalism. And then we have all of our bony landmarks. And so these activities, again, are trying to help you uh, relate that information to something that's familiar. Uh, so just take the time to jot stuff down. Use your, use your book, write right in your book. Um, if you don't want to do that, then, you know, you can maybe copy these off or uh, just use a separate piece of paper. I'm not going to check them, uh, but I will be able to tell if you've done this or not by how uh, proficient you are in what comes next, which is the palpating of the bony landmarks. And so uh, what this is asking you to do is use a skeleton, um, and we've got this one designated as in your classroom, but it might be a good idea to get a smaller skeleton. They're fairly inexpensive. You can get them at art stores, you can get them on Amazon or some other site. Um, and if you have a skeleton, if you get one that's maybe two feet high, um, you can use that a lot in this, in this study. You can look at the joints, you can use Play-Doh to build on it, or uh, you can, or a clay, you can um, practice range of motion and joint, uh, assessing range of motion by using joint movement on it. Um, you can use the, this little skeleton to uh, practice positions and draping and all that kind of stuff uh, in your fundamental studies. So it's a worthwhile investment to get one of those uh, as part of your own self-study. Um, well, so we're continuing on with the uh, bony landmarks. And the online course does a really nice job with this particular segment. Then we have our general um, divisions of the skeleton, appendicular and axial. Uh, and it's amazing to me, this is one of the things we'll show you in the classroom, that um, the limbs uh, are, there's a, there's a level of symmetry with those. The, the upper limb, the arm, starting with the scapula, which is the big platform that uh, attaches it to what's called the axial skeleton, 
which you think think of fish. Uh, so you've got you really don't have the limbs. Um, there's limb buds where some of the fins are at, but it's primarily a, a fish is primarily an axial skeleton, and then the big bones of the sh shoulder blade uh, and how it's designed um, are used to stick onto the fish, the longer limbs that we have. And same with the pelvic girdle. And the skeleton is actually easier to understand if you tip it so that it's on all, on, on all fours. So um, in a, a crawling type position. And then you'll start to see uh, the similarity between the uh, shoulder girdle that attaches onto the fish and then the construct of the arm, which has got one long bone, then a joint, and then the forearm, which has got two bones, and then there's a bunch of little bones in the wrist, and then it goes out to this, this platform. Now, we typically don't walk on our hands anymore. Um, when we assumed an upright position, it freed our hands up so that this is more about mobility. Um, and uh, the pelvis rotated so that we um, were able to weight bear on that. And so actually our legs are kind of on backwards. Um, but, you know, your elbow is your knee the point of your elbow here um, is like your patella and <clears throat> muscles actually organize themselves uh, and movement patterns through the nervous system organize themselves uh, in functional units and work together and, and the structure uh, of the bones and the joint where these uh, moving structures the muscles are like pulleys, um, are able to um, bend, bend the joint and, and create uh, a variety of movements. And, uh, and the driving reflex for this is gait, uh, walking, um, and uh, the vestibular system and the eye reflexes are, are huge. Uh, in terms of us being able to maintain an upright position. So um, it's pretty cool how it's put together. And so here's a great big picture of all of these parts. Most of you are pretty familiar with this already. I mean, this showed up in high school biology. Now, on your Canvas site, that, and Evolve if you're not uh, using Canvas, if you're in a different program than HEC, there are downloadable um, labeling sheets, um, and the answers are provided. That's one type of repetition you can use to learn this. Uh, so do make use of those. And then it's going to give you uh, individual bony framework by region here. So we're going to look at the axial skeleton first. Now we're going to dive down. And the way you want to learn this is you want to actually, you have a skeleton and you want to touch these areas as you are reading through this and helpful get your read to me feature involved. And as it goes through here, you know, you can um, actually kinesthetically touch or you can use your little skeleton that I strongly suggest you purchase. So um, here are, here's a picture of some of these landmarks. 
So these are the, these sutures are where the bones of the skull come together to create this compartment to hold the brain and protect it. So, so this is an, almost an exoskeleton here. Um, and then the structure is inside. We got the brain and then the vertebrae stack like Legos with holes in them for the spinal cord to come down through. Um, and in an infant, you can really feel these, but you can feel these on your own, you know, by mashing around on your head. There's a texture there and there's not a lot of tissue between um, what you can palpate here on the scalp and the, and the skull. So it's pretty easy to feel. Just like a, a, right around a joint, there's usually a, a little less tissue. So you can feel and palpate the bony structures a little bit more than you can in the fleshier parts. So um, touch, 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 touch. So these are, this is the uh, disarticulated part of the skeleton. And there gets to be too much language here. So look at the main parts. Uh, and those main parts are often pulled out for you into a box that's going to refer you to a figure. And then there are gonna be these types of associations, mnemonics, where you're gonna make up uh, for the cranial bones, for example. There's an example here. Please stop the flying ostrich egg. And then that helps you go parietal, sphenoid, temporal, frontal. Uh, occipital and ethmoid. So do that. Share those with each other. So here are our facial bones and then the holes in the bones that are sinuses that plague us. Um, and then th this starts to show you the vertebrae that are also part of the axial skeleton. And while they're individual bones, they stack together and they're bound tightly with ligaments um, to create a tunnel. This nuchal ligament right here is a pretty cool structure. Um, muscles attached to that, uh, starting from deep to surface, you have a one layer, two layer, three layer, four layer that come in here and, and fill this up and use this as a place to stick on to. Um, and uh, it, people are uh, it, this is a hard structure to visualize, but the, it, the way this is organized and how we have to try to uh, hold our head up, um, the, uh, this is a connective tissue type structure. It's a ligamentous structure. Uh, and there are mechanoreceptors in there and other sensory receptors because it's always balancing our head. Uh, and it can be a, a source of sending through the sensory mechanisms discomfort um, that is kind of a naggy, achy kind of a sensation. So here's more with the individual vertebrae. And here is the box that is taking you through it step by step. Now each of these vertebral curves becomes important because it also is an area where you can get some spinal 
deformity, a, a change. Uh, so we call that lordosis or a uh, scoliosis or a kyphosis. Um, now the bones of the thorax, uh, the ribs, and how they attach to the uh, vertebral column in the back and the sternum here, clavicle, that all fits right in with breathing. So um, that cage acts as a, you don't see them very much anymore, but you used to have a, a bellows that you moved up and down <clears throat> that would pull air in and then push it out. And our rib cage kind of works like that. <clears throat> I've been doing so many of these to get ready for class to start that my throat is a little scratchy. So pay attention to this box, compare it to the figure. And there we go, there's our bellows. And then we're gonna get into the pectoral girdle, which is where we, um, have, we're starting in the appendicular skeleton. And this, a lot of boning landmarks here, and it's really, this is an area you need to really slow down and be able to find these, palpate these. Uh, lots of muscles attach here. And uh, it is an area where people often want massage targeted. And then here is our big long bone in the upper limb, which is the humerus. And again, you're gonna to wanna to know where these bony landmarks are. Travels down and gets into the lower arm, uh, which is the forearm. And again, our uh, learning strategy to make up funny little sentence that goes with this. And again, a reminder to share these with each other. So as we keep going, you can see that it's, it's just a matter of understanding the structure and reinforcing your working vocabulary that goes with it. And this is just how the whole chapter continues. So my suggestion is, is that you take a part at a time um, and concentrate on that for a day or two. Um, also draw this, uh, it doesn't have to be good. Um, and that can be really, really helpful. So there it is all together. Um, And then we get into our uh, pathological conditions. So there's disorders by trauma and the various fractures. There's usually a question or two about this that shows up on the m -black, So you're gonna wanna have an idea of what the different ones are. and um, how the bone repairs itself. If it, there is a fracture, uh, indications and contraindications about what to do and um, you know, stop and think about this and pay attention. Then we got other things like shin splints um, and plantar fasciitis, which just uh, plagues people. That's a, uh, down in the foot and it can be a bony issue. Um, it's more complicated than that. Um, it, it's where the, there is a uh, pulling, an ongoing pulling in the arch of the foot that yanks 
at the attachment points onto the bone and you can get some bony overgrowth. Sometimes it's called a spur, but there certainly is inflammation in the area because of that. It, and there's a demand there to um, adapt, to respond. And so, because bone is a highly regenerative uh, tissue, um, it really becomes active related to that uh, mechanical tugging and then the resulting inflammation that goes with it. So um, there can be a variety of conditions that occur um, related to a birth, uh, birth, uh, a, a malformation during birth. Um, a relatively common one that you might encounter is spinal bifida. Make sure that you always talk to the person um, that might have this condition and they will explain to you uh, how it affects them and how you have to adapt. In our society, cleft palate is, usual, is corrected right away. And so there really is not much we might be involved in with that. This is what sometimes people will uh, call a brittle bone. Um, and it, these people break their bones very easy. Um, massage would certainly have to be adapted related to pressure and any kind of movement activities. It's not that it can't, you can't, do massage with somebody that has osteogenesis imperfecta. It's just that you have to really stop and think about all the cautions. Um, club foot is almost always corrected surgically in our society. Some societies, these are not corrected uh, because the um, resources are not available for that. Um, and you might notice some scars here and maybe we can increase the pliability through that mechanical force introduction, maybe a little for a little while. Every once in a while, I'll see a question, can massage reverse club foot? And, and no, no, I can't. So, and then we have our spinal curve abnormalities and they're, uh, this usually starts in adolescence where there's exaggerated bone growth that can show up at birth and it can even be related to an injury or a persistent posture. Um, you know, if somebody is twisted a lot uh, for their occupation, for example, you might get some of this. Um, if it's functional related to an occupation, Massage may be able to help reverse that. Otherwise, it's more of a uh, symptom management. Um, and there's all kinds of treatments for this. Some of it's exercise, some of it's casting or uh, a, a, a vest. Sometimes it's surgery. Um, but it's the, the treatment of this is best left to the professionals and then we can help uh, with uh, how a person adapts and responds to those treatments uh, and or uh, resulting senses of uh, shortening or tightening. Maybe we can alleviate for a little while some of those symptoms that we talked about how that might work in chapter two when we were talking about managing various types of pain sensations. So here's an example of some of those spinal distortions. Um, why? I don't know, but often uh, Osgood Schlatter's disease uh, is found on the MBLEX exam. <laughs> so this is primarily an adolescent um, 
and uh, and it usually is because of the pulling um, the big lump on the tibia called the tibial tuberosity due to fast bone growth. Um, so, and that's also part of what growing pains are. The bone grows faster than the soft tissues. And so you, you get a tugging and then there's maybe a little inflammation or some aching. Uh, now, osteoporosis is common and it can occur as a part of an aging process and it can occur because of medication usage. So um, this makes the bones more brittle and uh, that will require an adaptation in massage as far as how much pressure uh, and how much um, stretching or aggressive movement we use with somebody. Um, so these are Paget's disease and uh, is a little less common, um, but disorders caused by radi radiation therapy. Radiation makes the bones brittle. So if somebody has had breast cancer, for example, and radiation was part of that treatment, then the bones over the radiation site could be more brittle. And then that would require us to uh, adapt based on pressure and you know, how aggressive we are in that area. You can have um, tissue um, death, especially if the blood supply is diminished. Um, you can have uh, a, a more genetic predisposition to the uh, spinal curves. You can also have um, bone formation secondary to inflammation. Um, so uh, this can um, be really uh, painful and we don't want to massage right over top of that area. So uh, then we have our infectious diseases, tuberculosis being the most common. Um, and bone, because it is such an active tissue, can be a site for, a primary site for uh, tumors, um, whether they're benign or malignant. Um, so be, be aware of that. It can often be, the symptom can be some deep aching that goes along with that. And bone pain is uh, really painful. So if you're getting a secondary um, malignancy based on metastasis, um, the, the pain related to that is really aggressive. So this is going to, again, all of these activities help you um, reinforce your information. And Medline Plus is excellent here. I strongly encourage you to search each of these on Medline Plus and get uh, another view on how this condition is going to affect somebody and the treatments that are involved with it. It will not give you the indications, contraindications for therapeutic massage because we don't have an agreement on that in the massage community. Um, we're making good educated guesses uh, when we're thinking about this you know, always being uh, motivated by do no harm and safety first. So sometimes the recommendations here are very conservative. Okay, um, we can have nutritional disorders and uh, while it would seem odd that these can show up, um, eating disorders that limit um, food or 
um, are purging the food before it gets a chance to um, be used as uh, fuel and, and for growth and for repair, uh, you can start to see these nutritional disorders show up or extreme diets um, where there's very limited food. Um, and while we don't see these as aggressively, um, they do show. And um, if you have a client, and you probably will, with some sort of food related behavior uh, that could interfere with nutrition, um, including uh, ongoing nausea, say from chemotherapy or something like that, uh, a, a nutritionist needs to be involved to um, help that person sort that out. Uh, that's a that's an interdisciplinary approach. That's not you giving nutritional advice. So here's our little scenario uh, that uh, will ask you to go outside of the textbook, gather information, think about it. Um, and it's targeting osteoporosis because it's so common. And um, then you know how to work with these questions. Uh, don't discount these. Again, remember, you should know the names of all, you know, you should know what each of these words mean, uh, regardless if they're the right answer to the question. And that is helping you with the terminology retention and then the application retention down through here to support critical thinking. Write your own questions. Um, we will have a setup where we're collecting those um, and we'll also use those for review. So there you go, the skeletal system. So as you work through this, the information will then be reinforced when we get into the next chapter of the joints, because obviously joints are made up of bones. Um, and that is where we move. And there's a language there as well that is going to have to be absorbed. Okay.